Nothing short of a masterpiece. That is one big pile of shit. Hello and welcome to Bad Movie Book Club, brought to you by the Grayskull Power Company. That's what you decided to go with. <laughs> um, the corporate sellout whore. <laughs> anyway, I am your host Drew. With me, as always, is the wonderful co-host Liam. We're back. We're back from the time tunnel. We were lost, but now we're back and somehow on YouTube. Huh. What is this weird place? What are all these pictures in my head? I can't get them out. I don't like it. I don't like it here, Drew. Unfortunately, it's free. I know. Can't we just go back to the old way of going to SoundCloud, putting up an episode, and then having them delete our previous episode? That worked out so much easier. <laughs> I suppose we could, but I don't like not knowing where my things go. Anyway, we're back. Let's get let's get into the swing of things. What, what movie are we talking about this week, month, whatever increment of time we do this podcast in? Oh, today we are taking a look at the incredibly, I don't, I actually don't know what superlative to give it this one, um, overproduced? Yeah, this is definitely the highest budget movie we've reviewed yes. so far. Sorry, we're talking about Masters of the Universe. I'll probably put some echo in there for, for funsies. <laughs> uh, you do what you need to do. I mean, overproduce the hell out of it if we're going to keep it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it actually took me a while to find this one. So I proposed this movie because I would heard somewhere that there was a live-action He-Man movie starring Dolph Lundgren, and I was like, sold. I want to watch this so bad. And I looked for it for a long time, and I couldn't find it because I was searching for He-Man, not just Masters of the Universe. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. I I typed in He-Man movie, and it took me to a couple of reviews for it, and I got the title from there. So, for me, it wasn't that bad. I eventually found it, but it took some work. But the one thing I gotta say is, you didn't prepare me for that at all. I was not preparing to see Dolph Lundgren in that film, and oh my goodness. Alright, but can I be honest? I was a little disappointed with this movie. I mean, Dolph Lundgren, he gets the title role, but he does not have a lot of screen time. Mm, I have a lot to say about his his uh, role in this whole production in general, I, sh- I should say. I, I've got a lot to comment on about that, but I think we should we should uh, jump in first. For, but before before we break the seal on the, on the spoiler gate, um, I'm sure there's, like, for all five of our listeners out there, there's at least one that doesn't know what a He-Man is. I'm going to be honest. I'm... I'm that one. I've never seen He-Man before. Oh, man, you are missing out. Good, because I'm hoping you can explain a lot, because this movie sure as hell did not. Yes. So. Like, I know Skeletor, I know He-Man, and I know Beast-Man going in. And when I finally figured out that Man of Arms was Man of Arms, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm passingly familiar with that name. But all right, here's my first question for you. Did they always have laser guns? Like, I remembered it being swords and <laughs> magic. Again, we'll have to cover some of this in the actual review. But to answer your question, kind of, sort of, yes? Um, yep. All right. The thing you have to remember is that He-Man was very much a product of what I like to call G.I. Joe fever. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those shows that was made entirely to sell toys to kids. Right, exactly. And what was really interesting is that the person who started it, I forget his name, it escapes me at the moment. Milton um, Bradley. (laughs) He wishes. Um, (laughs) But no, the guy who originally started the line got the idea after trying to negotiate toy deals for Star Wars with LucasArts. And LucasArts turned him down. He's like, well, I'll just start my own space toys. And make all the money. Um, and apparently he did. I guess. So, good on him. 
Um, so, from what I can recall, it's actually been a while since I've seen an honest goodness episode of He Man and Masters of the Universe. Um, for most, for most of it, they got the storyline correct. So, Gray Skull is supposed to be resident to this huge ultimate cosmic power. Um, very yin and yang keeps everything in balance. Skeletor and his mercenaries are looking to get that power, and oh, now I can't remember the name of the world they were on. Eternia. Oh, thank you. Oh, I can't believe I forgot that. Yes, and the Eternians are the ones kind of keeping them at bay. So the part of the story they didn't really cover, and this is where the quote-unquote interesting part of it is that the Prince of Eternia, his name's Adam, he's very much like a uh, Luke Skywalker person. He's the hero, but you kind of want to punch him in the face. <laughs> yeah. Prince Adam, um, he's sort of the good-for-nothing prince, and he's setting a lot of worries in town about whether or not he'll be able to live up to, to Daddy's expectations. And he stumbles across this sword that, lo and behold, gives him the power of Skull, and said sword turns him into He-Man. Gotcha. Along the way, he recruits several allies, most of them under the employ of his king, the or his father, the king, rather. Um, and they are the masters of the universe. So it's kind of masters versus mercenaries, which, by some very strange coincidence, also makes a really great plot for competing toy lines to sell all the things. Right, right. It's amazing how that works out. So, for the most part, they got the storyline fairly accurate. They had some unique characters in there, not from the show. Uh, like, a few of the mercenaries weren't from the show. Also, um, Gulork, or whatever his name is. I have such a terrible time with fantasy names. Yeah, well, we can get into that. All right, look. Let's open those spoiler gates and let's actually just get into this. All right, firing it up. Woo, it's scary. I haven't seen these doors in a long time. Warning, the spoiler gate is opening. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. The show will be entering a spoiler zone from here on out. If you do not wish to experience spoilers, please turn off the show now. The spoiler gate is open. Warning! The spoiler gate is open. This is not a drill. Everybody, this is not a drill. The show will be ending. The spoiler gate is Alright, so let's just jump right in. Yeah, as this movie does, all right, can I just first off say, so coming into this, having never watched He-Man and not having any of this explained, the impression I got from, if we consider this movie a three-act story, which is stretching it a bit, I have never seen a movie in such a rush to get to the second act. <laughs> the entirety of this movie, of the beginning of this movie, is just like, I've got places to be, let's skip through this. It just opens with Skeletor bursting in and like, I have captured Grayskull! Oh, no, no, wait, no, it... I have to give you a pause there, because it actually starts my favorite way for any terrible movie to start, and that is with the narration a la Hercules 1983. Yeah, all yeah, right. Again, I got really excited because there were rainbows in space, and then credits, and then an explosion for no reason. <laughs> there is a universe, and things are in it. Let's watch some of it. Yeah, yeah all right. So you gave me like the basics of the storyline, and even just having a passing knowledge of He-Man, I knew this. But then we're already in Grayskull. It's already been besieged. It's already been captured. And all three of Eternia's soldiers are, like, not there anymore. <laughs> all three yeah, of that's them. that's all I ever see. I don't see anyone else, the entirety of this movie, as a citizen of Castle Grayskull. Well, aside from the sorceress, who I don't understand at all. Anyway, let's... Oh, uh, yeah, Evil Lynn, they kind of took some liberties with. Um... No, no, I meant the one that's trapped in, like, the light tube. Oh, right. So she's she's the sorceress that's supposed to look over Grayskull. Like, she's Grayskull's warden, basically. And she's the one that bestows the power to He-Man to do all the awesome things. Uh, okay. But anyway, open to the first scene, 
Skeletor comes walking in with all of his uh, Stormtrooper wannabes. They're sort of like um, World War II era German soldier helmets on like Darth Vader masks with then like, you know, latex uniforms. And honestly, I don't think the analogy to Star Wars ends there because honestly, when I first saw that scene, I just thought, hmm, this looks very much like a recycled set oh, yeah. from the Cloud City. Yeah, the set is very recycled from Star Wars. Um, Skeletor's costume is very the Emperor. Yes. Although, can I say, I actually really liked the practical effects of Skeletor's face. I did until they got close up onto his nose, and I could tell it was like a weird plasticky thing, and it was kind of like, ew, gross. Yeah, the nose is a little weird. Also, the fact that, I don't know if you caught this, but did you notice that Skeletor is dubbed? Did you know that more than just Skeletor is dubbed? <laughs> Well, yeah, I, but he's like the subtlest of the dubbing because his mouth doesn't move very much. Right. Which is why he had to be dubbed. But. Yeah, I did notice it was kind of irking that uh, whenever he talked and had to say like P words or M words, you know, things that require your lips to close. They He couldn't do it with that no. makeup on. No. Which always begs the wonderful question, how does he eat soup? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that being said, I really liked his... I liked the design for his face. It didn't really actually look like a skull. He was kind of like a burn victim. Almost. Like he would have been a really good Freddy Krueger. Right. Right. And I think once I got used to it and I got over the fact that they ruined He-Man, I was okay with it. <laughs> um... With that being said, so basically the first thing he does is he goes in, he monologues, and then casts a magic spell and brings a woman to orgasm all within the first three minutes yeah, of the okay, movie. Like I said, this movie has places to be and things to do. It doesn't have time to explain to you why there's just some kind of old woman standing next to the throne and Skeletor is using magic to get her off. Right, so to preface this... The woman in question is actually the sorceress that we've mentioned before. She's the Warden of Grayskull. And so he's supposed to be casting this spell to absorb her power, and it's supposed to look painful. I don't think the actress knew that, because she clearly looked like she just got... Don't finish that analogy. <laughs> I don't want to picture it, whatever you're about to say. <laughs> she got the magic in all the right places. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah, moving right along because I want this conversation to stop uh, we <laughs> cut to the desert and Grayskull's like in the background on fire and there's some stormtroopers who have like a goblin in a fishing net yes and this is the guy whose name I can't remember um, yeah no I never caught it uh, just to give you a heads up, uh, I don't think I caught anyone's name except for the ones I already knew. Okay, so... And that includes the human characters. Um, well, Monica is Monica. I never watched Friends, so I just know her as Courtney Cox. Oh, okay. By the way, Courtney Cox is in this movie. Yeah, Monica's in this movie. I don't remember who the guy's name, I should probably look him up. Whatever, I'll have, fut I mean... I'll have future me do it. Future Drew here. His name is Gwildor. 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 The person he's supposed to be replacing, I suspect, uh, is Snarf. Well, that's a different series, sir. We don't talk about him on this podcast. Oh, wait, is he Thundercats? He is. Damn it. Yeah, so, but there's another character like that in He-Man, and his name is Orko, and he's like a magician. Oh, is he the floating wizard guy? Yeah. All right. Yep, it's floaty wizard guy. And so, again, he's kind of like the comic relief character, but he's also super useless. Well, I mean, he plays sick synthesizer solos. He do Oh my god, the key. That made my music hurt. Hang on. In... Just, I know, Dad, but hold on. We're not there yet. We have to wait, you know, 30 more seconds into this review, or, you know, 15 scenes jammed into 30 seconds. 
Okay. Okay, so they free the orc goblin thing. Oh, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They don't do shit. He-Man saves this goblin guy in this great fight scene where, okay, so we've already proved I don't know that much about He-Man, but there's one thing I do know, and that he's got a killer page boy haircut. And as much as I love an 80s mullet, oh yeah, I was kind of disappointed oh. that we didn't get the page boy haircut. Yeah, that's true, now that you mention it. Part of part of the problem with my memory of He-Man, it's a little distorted, um, because they also recently, and by recently I mean like seven years ago or so, they came out with a revised He-Man cartoon that was absolute crap. But of course I didn't care, so <laughs> I watched them all, um, and it was, <laughs> and it was much more that style of a barbaric mullet that you see a la eighties. Barbaric mullets. <laughs> Well, I mean, if I mean if Conan can do it, why not He Man? I guess. I mean, yeah. And when I say fight, it's it's really weird because it's like all you get are close ups of Dolph Lundgren's muscles, and then people falling down. <laughs> well, hold on. There's only there's only one actual what I would call honest to goodness. He-Man fight scene. I don't know if you know this, but He-Man never fights with a gun. That's just not that's not his style. Yeah, no, I thought he had the sword. Like I knew about the sword and that was his thing, but he's like shooting all the time in this movie. And I think yes. I know why because if you actually look at the scenes where he fights with the sword. Wait, what? But, 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 we're not there yet. Talk about things. No, we're going to talk about them when we get there. Cuz it's important for something. Well, sorry. I... Don't let me stop you. You Please just stopped going. me. You literally... <laughs> Fine. Okay. So you got a point you wanted to make. Right, so because I want to make a point, we're gonna we're going to overlook that for now. Other than we are really, really disappointed to see He Man using a gun. I mean, you're disappointed. I just thought it was weird. You mean you were disappointed? Yes. You have chosen wisely. <laughs> uh. So anyway, we shoot the bad guys. He Man, freeze. Was it? Like Gwild Gwildy? I I don't know. Want... Say any combination of words that sounds stupid, and I'll just agree with you. <laughs> All right, so we free Benjamin Cumberbatch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So, well, you also remember. So after He Man flexes at the stormtroopers and they all fall down and die, and then he shoots them. Uh. Then his, like, two buddies, the entirety of the Eternian army, also shows up to help free, what was it, Benjamin Cumberbatch? Is that what we're calling him? Yep, we're going to call him Benjamin Cumberbatch. Gotcha. All right. Locking that away in my mind vault. Um, so, yeah, they show up and help, and we don't have time for introductions again. So, me, not knowing these characters, just moving right along. I'm just forced to accept it because... Ben, or Benjamin is like, quickly, we have to go to my hobbit hole. Cut to the hobbit hole, and like, a cross between David Bowie in Labyrinth and a troll doll is just on their ass, like, ready to bust down that door. Yeah, and so I believe that character, I believe that was the Beastmaster. It might not have been. It might have been the other guy with the weird hook hand. He did have a hook hand. Okay, so it was hook hand McGee. Um... (laughs) Yep. David Bowie troll doll hook hand McGee. Right. And I only say that because he was one of... We get to write these movies. (laughs) That's also... I want to iterate this, or reiterate it. We've done more of establishing who these characters are in our little whatever this is 
than they do in the entirety of the movie. Right. And I suspect that a, a large portion of that is due to them... Like, I think the only reason why they would do that is it had to be a strict choice of, oh, the kids will know who these ki- these people are. Which is weird, because they kept exactly one of the mercenaries from the show, and it was Beastman, not Hookans McGee. The, well, I, I know Beastman, so at least, you know, they picked the one that I know. Yeah. And I suppose Evil Lynn and Skeletor were in there too, but other than that, all the other mercenaries were not really ones that were part of the toy line until after the movie. <laughs> yeah, they had to bring out new toys. Of course. So, they get in the hobbit hole with Benjamin, and he's all like, I made this key, and that's how Skeletor beat your ass. And they're all like, oh, you're an asshole. In that key, oh my god. There's a greater philosophy to how this key works. First of all, the key is basically a TARDIS core. Again, I don't watch Doctor Who, so... Okay, that's it's a time... It's a dimensional vortex that is also a time machine. It takes you to any relative dimension in time in space. But it does it through six synthesizer solos and crazy psychedelic light shows It and spinning utensils. It does. So they have this incredible device handy, and what do they think to do with it? <laughs> You're right. Well, okay. I guess I didn't realize this when I was watching it, but they hadn't established that it could travel through time yet. So that's I, true. I just it was kind of just like an... so I didn't see the flaw that now I see you pointing out so obviously. Yeah, <laughs> they could have just gone back in time before he gave that first key to Skeletor. Yeah, it's like there, movie solved. And you know what? Even after they revealed it at the end, why didn't he just do that? Well, you know. Truth be told, at the end, by the end of the movie, there's not really any point to going back and like resetting things because He Man, guy who I actually at first thought was Will Ferrell's character from Anchorman in a riot cop uniform and some chick in spandex pants, <laughs> the three of them together kill like half of Skeletor's army and suffer no losses on their side, so it's a pretty good war for them. I suppose. As long as we uh, don't mind all that exposition that they didn't bother actually putting in the movie at the beginning where they stormed Castle Grayskull and announced that they've defeated all of the Eternian army. I never saw a single dead Eternian soldier, and the movie didn't bother caring about the exposition, so why should I? Fair enough. But yeah, needless to say, they don't think, oh, we can go back in time and prevent all this from happening. We'll just escape by normal means. And... How convenient is it that since their original plan was to use the key to storm Castle Grayskull, but then they had to escape because they were getting bombarded, so they escaped through the back door, which happened to lead right to the center of Castle Grayskull. (laughs) It's just so convenient. Yeah, Benjamin Cumberbatch lives in, like, the access tunnels to Castle Grayskull, and David Bowie troll Hook Hands McGee like kicks down that door in just a couple of minutes. This seems like a major security flaw. We didn't need a transdimensional key to exploit. And yeah, and so apparently Skeletor was supposed to be after him because he didn't want him to build another one of these keys, which he apparently already did. But he didn't think he was a threat just because he happened to have easy access to. <laughs> To where he was sieging? Well, no, okay, I kind of understand this. So, he's not a threat to Skeletor, because, you know, he's a little Benjamin Cumberbatch goblin creature that Skeletor could just magic to death if he ever came close. But the key lets the sorceress out of her orgasm light tube. Right, but he didn't need it to set the tube. I mean, the tube is what he cast on her. Right. So, And he was worried about the goblin making another key that could let the sorceress out. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, here's my point. 
he shouldn't have had to wait for the goblin to make the key in the first place for him to be a tactical advantage. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. He should have just gone to Benjamin's house, saw that there was a back door that goes into Castle Grayskull's throne room, and just said, oh, you know what, never mind, I don't need that key after all. Magic you to death, gonna go cast a beam of light on a sorceress. Right. Well, now that we've just punched the first five minutes full of holes, let's keep going. Yeah, again, this is a lot. I don't think I'm, you're actually kidding. This might all happen in the first five minutes. Yeah, it, don't. if you can manage to not blink for five minutes, I would recommend it would be the five minutes of intro to Masters of the Universe because you were going to miss something otherwise. I had to stop and rewind and just make sure I caught everything because it was a lot coming all at once. Yeah, it is. Like, I just rode the storm out, because I was like, I don't know this well enough to, like, fill it in the holes, and God, I am just lost, but okay, I think I can piece together what's happening. Yeah, so Benjamin Cumberbatch, He-Man, Team Mustache Dad, and 80s Bad Girl, which, by the way, those two characters are Man-at-Arms and Tila. Okay, uh, I got Man-at-Arms. He said that at some point in time. Right. I never got her yeah. name. Tila, the only way you would have known her was if you had been expecting her, because she's, like, supposedly the love interest, but at the same time she also hates Adam's guts. But Adam conveniently doesn't exist in this version of Masters of the Universe, so... Oh, yeah. He-Man is always He-Man. Even after he... Oh, mm, sorry, more spoilers. Yeah. If I have to hold my thoughts, you have to hold your fucking That's... thoughts. That's fair play, I assume. But anyway, so yes, this happy this happy uh, quartet goes to find our sorceress in the center of Castle Grayskull in her, what do we call it, the orgasm tube? Yeah, I, I don't like that term, but that's the one we're stuck Why with. Why don't we just call it the tube then? All right. <laughs> so she's in the tube. Um, she's just kind of standing there and she's, She's doing the typical damsel in distress. No, don't do it. It's dangerous here. It's a trap. Yeah, like, you have to run, He-Man, or else Skeletor and his army of minions will shoot at you. And then Skeletor and his army of minions come in and start shooting at him. And, of course, this naturally leads to uh, him finding out that there's another key. And they try and make a run for it by opening up a random vortex. Okay. This brings me to another... Well, before I get there, I guess we should say what happens next. What, about... About my absolute... Benjamin... Yes, about Benjamin... Play the synthesizer solo from hell. Yes, and how it jumps into... Like, honestly, when I saw the key and I heard what it did, I immediately thought, man, it would be crazy if it was this story point. There's no way it could be. And then it was. I was so excited. Yeah, the movie kind of takes a weird turn around the key. Oh, no, it's, it is it like, is one of my all-time favorite bad movie tropes, which is the quantum leap. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's not actually what I was talking about. Yeah, they oh. do the jump from uh, the cartoonish reality or the fake reality of whatever into our reality. And that was a really big popular thing in, like, late 80s, early 90s movies. And I was, oh, no, it's still... I mean, it still is, but that back then, then, it was like every other movie was doing it. Sure. And it makes a great way, A, to make cheap sets, now that they've wasted all of their budget on Grandiose set for the very first five minutes of the film. And B, it's a great way for people to show how their fantastic opinions about using fantasy worlds to solve all of the real world's problems. We'll get into some of those examples as life goes on. So they jump through the portal because if they stay in this throne room shooting Skeletor's guards, they're going to lose? Or, you know, this is a losing proposition? Even though, I mean, the stormtroopers are just being stormtroopers, you know, shooting broadsides of barns, and they're, like, sniping them off one by one. And they're using, like, laser guns, so there's no ammo to worry about. Not to mention, at the end of the film, they're back in this throne room shooting the same goddamn guards. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, no, and he's not shooting them anymore. He's He-Manning at them, but we'll get to that part in a second. So, yeah, they jump through the portal, and they land in, like, a swamp with a cow. Right. So, here's where I take issue with this. He supposedly entered random coordinates. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's not that it's a different dimension. It's just that it's a different galaxy in the universe where we happen to be. Given what we know about the size and scope of open space and the probability of actually landing on a hospitable place, (laughs) even under those conditions, I find it hard to believe for Benjamin Cumberbatch to have made that kind of a calculated risk. It's not even calculated risk. Because he... Well, we don't completely understand how the key works. It might be that it just opens certain, like, access points. And so he randomly dialed in a Stargate. Oh, I feel like you're giving you're giving too much reasonable doubt to this. <laughs> I think you're trying to pick a hole with something in the plot where there's so much more we can attack than we're worrying about. You ruined He-Man! I can suspend my disbelief on this one, just because there's so much else to go. Fine. It also doesn't help that they decided to use a musical instrument as analogy for the entire existence. It just, it makes my music hurt. That's the part that I was originally talking about when I said that it takes a weird turn with the key, because there's sort of this weird subplot that it's like, Everything is music, man. Music is what holds the universe together. Mm. I. So for those of you that might not know, my profession is musician when I'm not watching super awesome movies and then blasting them a new one. <laughs> and I would imagine... I would imagine that the effects that this movie had on me would probably be similar to a medical doctor watching an episode of House. <laughs> uh, yeah, House House makes my science hurt. Oh. I figured for you, being more sciencey than medical doctor, it might be like watching an episode of CSI. Uh, I mean, CSI is horrible, but House is amusing to me because... I like imagining doctors in the lab and how much that would be infuriating. Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Oh. That's a different episode. Yes, yes it is. So anyway, we woke up at a uh, cow swampland. Yeah, and they never say where we are. We just all we know is we're not in New Jersey because someone's moving to Jersey. Right. So I don't know where they keep cows adjacent to swamps, adjacent to barbecue diners. I, I've i gotten into this nasty habit. Um, i trying to think, when did I start? I guess it's since I started watching terrible movies and they all start looking samey in their settings that I just assume that if it's not mentioned, it's just that they end up in L.A. Because... All right. Uh, it's convenient. I guess, but, I mean, wouldn't that just be like a... I'm trying to think like a... Dead hipster, the little red tar pits, and the barbecue joint. Wouldn't what, what, what? Never mind. I was okay. like, the cow, a swamp, and a barbecue joint. There's, there's sort of three, like, very distinct and disjoint things. That's true. But if you've ever been to L.A., you'll know that it's a hell of a drug. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sorry. So, they appear in this swamp and they realized that the key for some reason like the three of them fell in the exact same spot but the key decided to rocket itself miles away i think it had something to do with it being uh sucked through the through the time vortex with the claw like i think somebody dropped it and then they like tried to grab it arcade style or something yeah, I mean, it's not important. It's just a plot device. Right. So they have to find it. Enter Monica Geller. Well, yeah. And this is where the movie finally slows down and gives you a little bit of expo- exposition. I don't understand any of it, but at least they tried to explain stuff to me. 
So apparently, Courtney Cox's parents are dead, and she's going to break up with her boyfriend and move to New Jersey. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like a typical L.A. afternoon. And she works at the barbecue place next to the swamp and the cow. Right. And all three of the... Oh, no, no, no. Two of the attorneys and Benjamin Cumberbatch end up finding the barbecue place because they're all hungry and crave a sweet bucket of pork. Which, by the way, is the only food consumed in this movie. I thought I saw a drumstick somewhere. All this, uh, there might be chicken too. Oh, but anyway, a bucket of meat Yes, is all they eat in this movie. There's like four different scenes and they're all just eating meat out of buckets. Which, by the way, is apparently barbaric. Oh, yeah. I didn't get that subplot at all. Like, apparently Eternians are all vegetarians, except, like, Man-at-Arms is all like, yeah, whatever, I'll eat it. Right, because it's total it's total nonsense. That was something they kind of plugged in. This is where I, where we start talking about how movie directors start using super fantasy themes to, like, narrate how life, should quote-unquote, should be. Oh, uh, okay. So you're saying that this was the director trying to be like, you know, in our utopian fantasy land, we don't have to kill cows to eat them. We simply walk up and ask for their delicious bounty of milk. Yes, more or less. All right, and look at how back-ass words you are, humans, eating your cows with the meat still on the ribs out of your buckets. But at the same time, they all just, like, go with it. Like, they're like, ah... Oh, Look at these barbarians eating their, oh, eating their meat in our bucket. Oh, oh, we're so good. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> like, I don't, so then what's the director trying to say? Is he trying to say, we live in this utopian fantasy, but holy fuck, barbecue's good. Like, maybe. <laughs> well, it seemed to me like, Team Mustache Dad, or I guess I should say Man at Arms, but he I think he was supposed to be okay with it because he was a grizzled, grizzled veteran that sometime had to live off of whatever he could find. And who knows what Benjamin Cumberbatch eats because he's not human. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So the only one who really had a problem with it was Tila. But she kept eating. No, she didn't. Yes, yeah, she did. Oh. Like, she makes a point of it, and she looks a little grossed out by it, but then she goes back and keeps eating. Who knows, maybe she was hungry. I guess. Which seemed to be the weird defining point for Man-at-Arms. Is this a thing like that was in the cartoons, that he's always hungry? Nope. Alright, well... Nope. That's what his character boils down to. I mean, he's like a riot cop, and he's hungry. Pretty much. Which is more characterization than... Tila gets. Yeah, they did a lot to Tila. I'll, we'll probably cover that at the end review. All right, yeah, let's move on with the story. So, the pace of this movie finally slows down, and we get this whole story arc about how Courtney Cox is going to leave her boyfriend, and then her boyfriend shows up for like this weird, awkward, like last date. I'm like, hey, babe, let me go take you to sound check for my band because I know you're about to leave me. And if, and her natural response is, sure, okay, but can we stop by to see my parents' grave first? And he's like, totally, all right, yeah. Like, it seems like he's done this before. Like, this is how all of their dates start. It's like, okay, yeah, we can go to the movies, but first I have to go check on my dead parents, make sure they're still dead. Yep, there they are. But how convenient, then, that they're this... Well, so they go to the cemetery, and she tries to explain how it's her fault that her parents died because they got on a plane, and she wanted to study, so they got on a different plane, and then that plane crashed. Well, so the... I think what ended up happening is they wouldn't have got on the plane if she hadn't lied to them. She lied to them about studying so that she could, quote-unquote, hang out with her boyfriend. I guess. I mean, I want to know what the hell her parents are doing that are just like, eh, let's just get on a plane, because w- they like wanted to go swimming, didn't they? Well, they originally wanted to go swimming, sw- but then they ended up like going on a plane to somewhere exotic when she didn't want to come along. Yeah. They're like, 
who the hell is like, all right, hey, honey, you want to go down to the beach and go swimming today? I'm like, no, I have to study. Okay, well, we're going to the Amazon. See ya. <laughs> Like, what kind of insane just gonna... lifestyle do these parents have? Quick, she says she didn't want to come. Let's fly the plane over the Congo. I hear that airspace is safe. <laughs> like, insane Amelia Earhart <laughs> explorers trying to break records in their planes whenever their daughter doesn't want to come along. Well, they don't ever really explain it. I mean... It's like... So what do you want to do? We could go to Disneyland or we could climb Mount Everest. You know. All in an, af yeah. all in an afternoon. Common Saturday activities. But yeah, so they're done with that, with that little sad story when they see a smoking crater in the middle of the graveyard. And lo and behold, it's some kind of funky synthesizer, a.k.a. the key... Which kind of makes me wonder how far away this graveyard is. Because I'm assuming it still had to fall within some proximity of them, right? <laughs> is the graveyard swampland? Like, they don't even bother burying the corpses. They're just going to throw them on there. Well, I mean, if they bury them, they're just going to float back up in a few weeks anyway. <laughs> um, and you feed that cow. And that's why the barbecue's so addicting. It's full of people. <laughs> I think I'm going to add some dramatic music in there. Oh, my God. All right. I think I just wrote the premise to He-Man 2, and it's going to be a way better movie than this one. <sighs> Good luck finding the budget for that, sir. I just need a, I need a burger shack, and some people are like, the cow's eating people from the corpse swamp. Yeah, I'd watch that. <laughs> So yeah, needless to say, because Kevin is this... I think his name's Kevin, right? I don't know. Boyfriend? He looked like a young Judge Reinhold to me, so that's what I called him. <laughs> okay, I'll call him I'll call him Reinhold. So Reinhold finds a... He finds the key, and being the super-duper musician that we are assured that he is... I mean, after all, he is in a high school band. Yeah, and he has a sound check that he's going on that's right. awkward, uncomfortable last date. And he has a friend, Carl, who owns this really sweet music shop back in town. I thought Carl was the janitor and it was like Pete or something was the music shop guy. Not important. I don't know why I'm debating oh. this. Neither character is important. Let's move on. Right. But anyway, he has a friend who owns a music store back in town. So obviously he's the current authority on all things musically related. Yeah, he's thereby a pretty sweet leather jacket. So you know that he's a bad boy musician. He's the real deal. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he uses his insane powers of deduction to determine that this fantasy object that looks like some weird kind of fantasy blender. <laughs> yeah, it is looks clearly... like dangerous. It's just covered in like spinning forks. And not and not like the safe kind of dinner forks. We're talking like carving yeah. set forks. Like, the kind of force that you would use to, to grab a steak off the grill. Yeah, this thing looks like it'd be really good at, like, uprooting a stump. But, so clearly he determines that it's some kind of Japanese synthesizer? I don't... Yeah, I thought it was really weird that everyone in the movie jumps to the, like, conclusion that this is Japanese. Like, it's obviously, it makes synthesized music, so the jump that it's a synthesizer isn't that bad. But everyone's like, yeah, I've totally seen these in Japan. Turning Japanese, Liam. Except for the cop who's worried that it's Russian. <laughs> I forgot about him. Yeah, how did you forget about him? He's way more of a character than He-Man. He gets a shitload more screen time. And a bunch of useless dialogue. Anyway. Oh, yeah. He's completely pointless. Except for the top of his head. Anyway. We, uh, let's see, where did we leave off? Oh, right. So, naturally, he decides to bring it to the sound check with him. Yep. So, he brings it to the sound check. He's like, babe, I wish you could stay and, like, watch my high school band perform at what appears to be prom that they're setting up for. And she's like, no, I have to leave you in the morning, so, God, it's like, I just, I don't want to be late for that. And she's, like, really trying to get out of it. And he's, like, begging her to stay and, you know, check out his band, and he's... 
playing his sweet new synthesizer, and it opens up and starts just, like, vomiting rainbows on everything. And then, hard cut, back to Eternia, where Skeletor's like, so, uh, where'd they jump to, guys? And they're like, oh, we found him, they turned the beep-boop machine on again. Yeah, it's currently beep-booping. Let's send our four top mercenaries, sword man, pointy ears, David Bowie, troll, hook hands, McGee, uh, and Beast Man. Beast Man. I, I reckon it, like, Beast Man, and then, like, I don't know, some sort of, like, guy with a cobra for a head, but, like, a frog's oh, breathing yeah, the, sack. Uh, we'll call him Red Shirt for no apparent reason whatsoever. Yeah, because he fails in the For no shirt. reason whatsoever. <laughs> little tiny spoiler gate. I'm just going to open it a little bit. He fucks up, and then Skeletor murders him. And he never gets a line or does anything in the entire movie. <laughs> I'm closing my tiny spoiler gate. Right. So, he sends them there with his own key. Um, hard cut again. Back to Kevin, who's like, This thing is too cool to be Japanese. I'm going to take it to the music store to see if my super cool music store friend knows what it is. Hey, uh, can you stay here? Oh, yeah. Again, weird, after, like, begging and pleading her to, like, hang around with him just a little bit longer. And what's even weirder, she's like, yeah, totally. Yep. Like, she cannot wait for this breakup. Seriously. Like, they're in just this uncomfortable, both of them know the relationship is over, but one of them just won't admit it. Needless to say that this makes it extremely convenient for the mercenaries to go to the location where all the lights were going down. And find completely the wrong person. Which kind of becomes the theme for the majority of this movie after a while. Yeah. Some guy. And he's like, hey, you can't be here. And they bitch smack him. And then they proceed to question Courtney Cox about the laser thing. She's like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Also, you appear to be some sort of combination of David Bowie's Labyrinth character, a troll doll, and a hook hand. So you're kind of freaking me out. What's the deal with that? And they're just like, laser the entire gym! Set it all on fire! Which made Blade very sad, because I don't think he ever uses a a laser gun the whole time. No, he doesn't use a gun. He's got two he's got two swords. And then like a third sword on his back that he never uses. Right. But in case he like loses the first one, he's got a backup. That's right. Also his ears are like knives. So he's got that going for him. his chin's like a knife. So he can hear with cutting precision. Or something, I don't know. Boo, but, uh, boo, boo. Thank you, I'll be here all night. Ugh. So she runs out, and they chase her into, like, some sort of crate warehouse. That like She doesn't go into a building, she's just running down the alley, and then suddenly she's in a building, surrounded by crates, and thankfully He-Man's there, and he's just like, oh. Are, you're safe now. Tell me what's happening. And I noticed something, and I had to pause and like look at it and try and go back and see. I can't figure out why. But in the time between her running down this alleyway and bumping into He-Man, she gets drenched. Like, she is dripping wet. No idea. Yeah, like, there's, there's no scene of her, like, running through water or anything, but, like, she is soaking wet. Maybe it's just, like, her sweat or something? No. Like, her clothes are completely wet. Her hair is completely wet. Oh, that's weird. I totally yeah, missed that. I have to go back and look at that now. weird. <laughs> that's funny. And, like, none of the mercenaries that are chasing her are wet. And like, he man, I mean, he's just, like, glistening always, so it's hard to tell. And so, He-Man, this is all super-duper convenient. He's like, oh, damsel in distress, I'll go do what I do best. Oh, look, it's the bad guys. That means that she must be important. And then he beats up all the bad guys in super He-Man fashion, and they run away with their tails behind their legs. Okay, can I talk about the sword now? Yes, he fine. fights with the sword for a little bit here against Blade, dude. Yes, all right. go ahead. So, I think the reason that he shoots his guns as often as he does in this, is if you watch the scenes where he fights with the sword, it's clear that they've made this sword out of like some sort of light foam that if they hit too hard, will break. Because in every scene, 
they do this thing of like the super fast swing and then stop right before contact and then make contact so as not to hit them too hard and accidentally break the prop. Not only that, but it's pretty obvious by watching them whenever a sword is swung, the actors have no idea what they're doing. For all the money that they spent on this, they did not hire a, like, I'm fairly certain they did not hire stage combatants. No. To choreograph any of it. They get away with a lot of it because, so, because they're so scared of breaking the prop, the actual, like, hand-to-hand combat stuff, they focus again on Dolph Lundgren's muscles. Like, just flashes of pecs and biceps, and you're kind of left to understand. It's like the birth of that shaky cam Jason Bourne fight scene of where you can't really tell what's going on because they're like zooming in and focusing on weird things. Oh yes, I call that the uh, I call that squirrel cam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is like squirrel cam's great great granddaddy of you know, Gopher Cam? Focus Pex Bicep Bicep Pex. Oh there's a sword. Okay, see he's still using a sword. I guess there's bad people. Pex Biceps! Oh, look, the bad guy fell down. <laughs> Get his gun and shoot him. We can show that part. Good to they put enough money in the post-production for it. Yeah, we have budget for lasers. So, the mercenaries run away. He's like, I've saved you. And he drapes his cape over her to, like, keep her warm because she's, like, got hypothermia because she's all wet for some reason. For plot device. Yeah. Meanwhile, the prom is burning down and Judge Reinhold is, like, trying to get this thing checked out, and he sees a bunch of fire trucks going over to the prom hall. So he's like, okay, what if prom's on fire? I have to go check on Courtney Cox. Oh, no, it's even better than that. It's How how convenient would it be, Liam, if music shop owner friend just happened to have a CB scanner oh, God, in, the, in right. the back of his shop yeah, so that he can scanner. so that he can listen into police conversations oh. and so and so he says oh no not the school cafeteria that's where i left girlfriends yeah so he like goes and he's like i got to go save her and uh enter sergeant Q-Ball. yeah just that great cop character that's in so many movies and television of like the short fat bald detective who is like you know i hate you protagonist because you're making my job harder blamber 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 and and the kids and the pokemans and the the loud drugs and their skateboards and their leather jackets and yeah they're playing the rock and roll music with their crazy synthesizer blender from Japan that might be Russian. Yeah, you know, I give him a lot of crap, but he, he has a lot on his plate. Now that, now that I've listed it all out like that, like, he has... There's a reason he's so ornery. He, he's got a lot to worry about. I'm, I'm sorry, cue ball cop. I take it all back. You know, he probably has the most in-depth character development of anybody in the movie, but he's also clearly the least important character. Yeah, so... Judge Reinhold's complaining about, like, how his girlfriend was in the building, and, oh, God, they've got to find her. And, you know, Captain Q-Ball's all like, that's extra paperwork for me. Let's just go drive around town and see if your girlfriend's alive somewhere. Let's go break into her house, which Judge Reinhold... Yeah, so Captain Q-Ball takes Judge Reinhold to the house of Courtney Cox. Right, because he was whining like a little bitch. He was. And he also confiscates his blender. And he's like, all right, let's see if she's home. So Judge Reinhold just walks up to the door and, like, opens it and walks in, which is technically breaking and entering. Sure is. She just He just wanders into this person's home and, like, helps himself to a bucket of chicken. And Kevin's, or Reinhold's, I don't know why I want to call him Kevin. I'm just feeling Kevin. His character name might actually be Kevin. Oh. It doesn't sound wrong. But neither does Reinhold. So. <laughs> yeah, I should, again, straight. This is not Judge Reinhold, but he really looks like Judge Reinhold. So, Kevin Reinhold. <laughs> Kevin Reinhold? <laughs> his, I love it. His reaction to this is oh, she must not be home. Which, by the way, if she lives there, who the hell lives there if her parents are dead? 
It's just her, I guess. I mean, we don't know how old she is. She's supposed to... Well, supposedly she's either in high school or she's a pedophile. Okay, yeah. He's in high school, at least. We know that much. And he might be 18, and, you know, don't judge love. (laughs) Or the lack thereof in an awkward relationship where she's trying to get out of it. Like, that adds a whole new layer of weird to this. (laughs) But, yeah. How convenient would it be if he just happened to be at her house when she starts calling on on the payphone? Oh my god, yeah. That You're right, that makes no sense. No one but her lives in this house. Why is she calling her house? I mean, granted, we don't we don't have the easy cop out of cell phones in the 80s, but still, how convenient would it be is like I really need to call my boyfriend. The last place I knew he was going to be was the music store. But I she know. Not, she doesn't. Even, I'll call my own house. She doesn't even like go into this attention of calling him. She just calls her house because she's genuinely surprised when he answers her phone. Oh, that's right. So she was just was she gonna I leave guess. herself a message? I don't. Like it's, it's like he man. This is really important. God, we have to find my right. my future ex boyfriend. But first, I really have to leave myself a message for to remind myself to. Like I got I gotta get eggs. I gotta go to the grocery store and get eggs and, tomorrow, and you know I don't want to forget again. And I really I have to make sure I twice. Like, let the trash out. Oh, oh, and I have to dump my boyfriend. <laughs> Almost forgot again. God. Well, the more I think about it, the more this is like baffling me. It's like blowing my mind. Well, that's the thing. Like this movie is so highly produced that it's very easy to forget. My God, the, they're just sitting here, just spoon feeding me bullshit, and I am eating it up. <laughs> Yeah, they fly a lot under the radar. And for whatever reason, Kevin Reinholds decides to make this a super awkward, one-sided conversation. Yeah, so the cop's hassling him because he's like, where's your girlfriend? Where's my girlfriend? I don't know. Let's go look for her. And then his girlfriend calls, and he should have just been like, oh, it's Courtney Cox. Mystery solved. You can go home, good sir. And officer's like, all right, thank you. Now I don't have to do that paperwork. My part of the story is done. I can go home. Everyone goes about their life. But no. But he had to be super weird about it and was like, oh, I shouldn't tell you that he's here. Hi, you. He doesn't even make an alias for her. He just, like, botches the whole thing. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. Even even for Sergeant Q-Ball, he, like, understands what's going on. This is pretty dumb. And then he pieces together, oh, you're talking about this Japanese-Russian thing. And then he starts fiddling with it, which, you know, when you beep-boop the beep-boop machine, then the bad guys can track you. So they're all like, yeah, let's, uh, I know where they are now. So we start following him. Meanwhile, Kevin Reinhold goes to the fridge and gets a bucket of meat and puts it in the microwave, which jams the beep-boop signal. Oh, I almost forgot about that. That's another example. How could you forget? That was like my favorite scene in the movie. I, I was too busy being upset with all the plot holes. But uh, no, and but this is another great example of how the directors were trying to show how things were bad. And we can use fantasy worlds to correct oh, them. Wait, were they trying to say that microwaves give you tumors or something? That would be my guess. They're like, oh, look, this radiation exists because it's jamming the signal. I think they were just trying to have a moment of humor. Oh, okay. I think you're reading a little bit too much into this. Okay. Also, we should mention... I. Just realized that since the beep boop is jamming, it someone had to be smart enough to say, "Let's blow up the jamming signal." So the mercenaries have gone back to Grayskull and reported oh, right. that like He Man has an army of magnet men or something. Well, I mean, that beat them up. Well, I mean, they knew they were going to be in trouble anyway. You didn't want to say, "Oh, the one guy that we were sent to go get beat us." Yeah, he beat us up, and Skeletor is all like a group of four mercenaries yes. you know this one guy who's like essentially superman you sent four schmucks to go like look poor david bowie troll doll hook hand he's only got one hand i mean come on but they go report to skeletor that you know he man has his army of magnet men and beat them all up and so skeletor gets all mad and a shocking <laughs> plot twist kills cobra head Totally going to be more dramatic music right there. Oh, yeah. Like, I need the dramatic, like, dun, dun, dun. 
that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And now he now he sends out his uh, his home run hitter, Evelyn. No, careful. Uh, you have to say it just right. Her name's not Evelyn. It's Evil Lynn. Fine. Sends out Evil Lynn. Because <laughs> that's just the stupidest goddamn... Uh, he sends her out, and she scans the battle area where he fought... Like, the mercenaries fought He-Man. And she points, like, this gigantic gun with, like, spinning radar dishes and a little LCD screen, and it lets her, like, replay the fight. Right. So, another question. If they have a device like this, why couldn't they have used that to, like, try and locate where the device may have been? Mm, I don't know about that. That's a bit of a stretch. No? All right. I don't know. I don't, hey, I mean, if it works several times look, with revelations in this movie, but I don't think that one's. Well, well all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that if it worked for Warehouse nineteen or Warehouse thirteen, yeah, but you still had to know where it was initially. So yeah, I guess they could have gone to the initial impact site, but they never knew where that was. No, they didn't. But you know, at the same time, they could have brought it in. To the you know, they could have brought it in instead of just yeah I without guess, melting right. the place down. Yeah, they could have just brought it to the gym and scanned. But God, but did, no, they right, decided instead to use it to just what? put another one on the board. You just blew my mind again. <laughs> I'm just saying. Obviously, the first practical application of this technology is to make fun of your coworkers. Yeah. It's not just the first, it's the only one, because she, like, throws it on the ground after that. She's like, all right, I've got my chuckles for the day. Let's put down, in, in her defense, this thing is giant and clunky and annoying to carry around, so. Fair now enough. that she's got her laughs, just throw that shit on the ground and move on. She, I guess they basically, oh, no, that's when they find that, is that the house, yeah, that's right? that's when he starts beep-booping, and they track the beep-boop, but then Kevin Reinhold makes his microwaved bucket of meat that's right yeah and and so now the cop decides to leave because he gets all annoyed about the phone call and the exploding microwave uh, yeah well hold your horses there so evil lynn is like they're jamming our tracking of the beep boot machine destroy the jamming signal and they press the destroy the jamming signal button and kevin reinhold and Captain Q-Ball barely managed to, to, to dodge the exploding microwave full of meat bucket. That's true. And I have to say, it was a pretty good job making that explode. I have to kind of wonder what that microwave was made of. It, they probably just put an actual bucket of meat in a microwave. Un underneath some TNT or something? But I, like, I can't imagine a microwave actually exploding with that much force well it was overloaded with the blow up a jamming signal device <laughs> signal fair enough also if they have something that can blow up devices that have signal that are emitting signals <laughs> yes! oh my god damn you drew <laughs> they could have just blown up the key. <laughs> how did i not realize any of this <laughs> because it's so shiny the movie is so shiny, it razzle-dazzles you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> ah, but even so, the story continues. What do we call him? Captain Q-Ball? Sorry, I'm just... I'm so beside Getting myself. lost in all the names. Yes. Yeah, Captain Q-Ball decides to take this, you know, synthesizer to make sure it's not like a Soviet spy. Right, and he takes it back to music store friend, leaving uh, Kevin Sanchez. Is that his name? <laughs> it is now. <coughs> All right. So yeah, <laughs> leaving Sanchez Kevin. Is all alone. And Evelyn and the rest of the mercenaries have tracked the beep boot machine back to his house, and they like beat him up a little bit, and then they put on this weird like giant collar, like that thing from a. Uh, God, what was that shitty movie with... Um... You have to be more specific on a show like this. 
Will Smith and you have to be more specific on a show like this. It, um, with the giant robot spider and their cowboys, Wild Wild West. I love that movie. I hate you. So, <laughs> you remember the big um, tin collar thing? Oh yeah, with the uh, saw blades of death. Yeah, so it looks like that, except with like an LCD screen that goes across with like a blinking light. And then his voice gets all robot and he has to tell the truth to any questions that are answered, or questions that are asked of him. I guess that was straightforward enough. And then they just kind of leave him there. I was with the with the collar with on the collar thing, and then he man Courtney Cox. Um, mustache, riot cop, and spandex pants come bursting in and like, we found you, Kevin! Or, yeah, Sanchez! <laughs> and he's like, yes, you have. Thank you for finding me. And like, then uh, riot cop is like, there. this is the color of Zumacalis or something. Like, he gives it a name. Like, as in, it is a unique item that they just left on this dude. And didn't bother to come back for or worry about taking with them. But thankfully, Riot Cop's got a key to this thing, so he just pops the lock and takes it off. Yeah, that's what I noticed. Like, he didn't, like, pick the lock or anything or just turn some knobs that are already on it. He pulls something out of his pocket and inserts yeah. it into this device and then claims that, oh, yeah, Skeletor is the only one that likes to use this. Shifty eyes. It's very strange. Yeah, so Kevin Sanchez is all like, I told him that the, that the thing was at the music shop, and we have to go stop them. Quick, let's hop in this pink Cadillac that makes the sound of a jet engine. Well, right, but this is, okay. This one I am going to insist. This is another example of where they're like, we have to, we have to change our terrible ways. Because it was originally a clunker car that was supposed to be some kind of gas guzzler, but but Benjamin Cumberbatch upgrades it so that I I think he said it works on nitrinos. Don't know what they are. Pretty sure it's not a thing. <laughs> but he does make the flippant comment. Now we don't have to worry about those pesky carbon emissions. Uh, I might have missed that. Greenhouse gases solved. I might have missed. I think this is right around the time I started checking out of this movie. Okay. So, right. So, once again, Eternia managed to solve all of the U.S.'s terrible economic and global problems. Also, um, Benjamin Cumberbatch is dressed like a pimp. Yes. Because that's how he decides to blend in. Yep. I totally forgot about that. And he arrives on the scene... So naturally, Kevin Sanchez decides to freak out. Okay. Actually, that makes more sense. If he souped up the pink Cadillac, that explains why it was making jet engine noises. Yes. That, that was what was going on there. He souped it up. Gotcha. And maybe that explains why they were able to beat the mercenaries to the music shop, even though they had like a 15-minute head start? No, it doesn't, because they supposedly had left at the same amount of time... Because remember, the the light show didn't happen until after the phone call, right? Yeah. Okay. So after the phone call would have been when they had left from their current location to get to the house. Uh-huh. So that means that He-Man and the Masters had to have known about it before the light show, meaning that they had a clear head start. No, they know that, they know that it's with Kevin Sanchez... In Kev er, at uh, Courtney Cox's house. Right. So they go to Courtney Cox's house, and then he's like, I told them that it's at the music shop, that it's on its way to the music shop, and so right, but when Evelyn interrogates them, they head out to the music shop, and then like five or ten minutes later, He-Man shows up, gets the same information, and then they head to the music shop. Right, so here's... And they get there before the mercenaries. Right, so here's my point. If he... If he was fast enough to have been able to beat them there on a fl <clears throat> using a ground vehicle when they're using a flying vehicle and they had a 10-minute head start, he should have also been there first at the house 
because <laughs> he had the information of where it should have been at the time before but they were win. on foot. Yeah, no, they were on foot when they go to the house. Right, but that's not because... but that goes out the window once you realize that they were also No, they weren't on foot. They were they rode up in the pink car, remember? Cuz they flew off, pink car drives up. Okay. I think we're worrying too much about <laughs> Damn it, I am going to poke these holes if it's the last thing I do. The logistics of travel in this maybe not where we need to be focusing. Sure. But yeah, so... You just want to blow my mind again. I, I'm on to you. No, I'm just... I, I am a little more than, than mildly upset at this movie for many things. <laughs> It was this was an uncomfortable movie for me to watch, but damn it, I watched it just for you, Liam. Uh, I'm right there with you. I checked out. I think in the third act, I checked out right after the music store battle. So let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so after they figured out, oh, this is where we need to be. Another cut. Now we see Captain Cue Ball and generic store friend talking about it and he's like so do you know what this is and he's like no i've never seen it i think it's japanese and he's like are you sure it's not russian yeah i think he meant to say russian son that's japanese that's a really weird dialect you're using to say russian right yeah that's an odd pronunciation of russian and then he-man and all of them show up and like they just grab the key back grab captain cue ball's gun and they're like, all right, we need to set this up. This shall be our final stand. Uh, Benjamin, get to work on pressing the beep boop buttons to get us back home. Which, I have to say, for all the language that they're using, Music Store Friend was pretty okay with them using his his capital and assets as walls and barriers. Well, in his defense, they did have laser guns. Fair enough. Yeah, I don't think he really had a choice in this. Like, at this point, He-Man just kind of like points a gun at everyone. He's like, get in the back room. We're barricading ourselves in. You press the beep boop buttons. No, it was you. Let's set up some perimeter. It was Captain Cue Ball that was doing it. He was pointing the guns at everybody, and then I think He-Man just like punches him and tells Tila to do it because you know. Yeah, someone. Ta- yeah, he does pull a gun, and then someone takes it from him and. But at that point, they were already in the back room. Right. Like, he starts off by sort of gun hold pushing them into the back room. Right. Yeah, and so then, sure enough, you know, all the armies of Skeletor arrives on the scene, ready to ready to do battle. Completely unnecessary jumping through glass window scene. Um, and then lots of red and blue lasers firing back and forth and missing their marks. Although, I do like that... I understand Skeletor's army a little bit more. Like, his army of stormtroopers makes sense more than a lot of other armies of stormtroopers because their lasers set shit on fire. That's like, true. They don't... <laughs> but they always seem to just burn down wherever they're fighting. This is true. The, and then the other thing that's kind of weird is sort of the back and forth. Like, you get a few good action shots from the fight and then it cuts back to, like, the boring, okay, we have to calibrate the device. We have to press the beep boop buttons... Meanwhile, Courtney Cox is, like, wistfully looking out that back window. Oh. And her mom is just, like, hanging out in the alleyway, like, Hey, hey, come out here. Surprise, I'm not dead. Yeah, it raises two questions for me. One, I was like, when I saw her originally just, like, looking out the back window all wistfully, and it's, like, cutting back and forth between her, like, I wonder what's going on with that rat in the alleyway. And, like, epic fights, uh, like, lasers going everywhere. The cut back to her looking at the alleyway. Like, did, did anyone think about, like, maybe sieging this place from both the front and the rear? Yeah. But then her mom walks into the alleyway. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I get it now. This doesn't make any more sense, but at least there was a plan. That being said, put yourself in Monica's shoes for a second. Okay. You were distraught. You were having the worst day because yep. You're feeling sad because you were responsible for your parents' death. Uh-huh. So saith you. <laughs> you're about to leave your boyfriend that you don't really care about 
and the music store in, in the front of the shop is just getting blown to smithereens and it's really depressing you suddenly see your mom's reanimated body waving at you and smiling you don't think to tell anybody about yeah. this? yeah you don't seek any validation yeah. for this whatsoever Personally, I'm just like maybe i'm losing my mind and goes up but all right so she's just like rolls with it it's like all right I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go talk to my dead mom who's not dead. And they have this conversation about, you know, how they're, they weren't really dead and they were like working on a secret project that, um, JK. Well, hang on. So, you know, when the scene started, I was like, Oh yeah, that evil in chick's probably like a magician or some shit. And like, this is the illusion of trick the hero into giving up the thing. Okay. Whatever. But because this movie had just like, glazed over so much exposition and just kind of thrown so many things at me that I was just forced to believe. There was a small part of me that actually thought for a second, like, wait, is this actually going to be the story? Because it goes on for a while of, like, it really kind of sells it to you if you know, if I, this was a rational movie and rational human beings would be like, no, wait, this is clearly a trick, but since I'd had to swallow so much on faith, I was like, Wait, is is the are the parents really not dead? Like, was this really just some sort of elaborate faking of their own death? Are they working with He-Man? Like, I actually started to like think maybe this was real. Yeah, I I think the only thing that cued me into it is it's actually a bit of a trope for evil Lin to assume the identity of some of an ally like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are a couple instances no, in like, the cartoon. When it started, I was like yeah. right on board with okay, this is the trap. But it just went on for so long. Right. I was like, maybe, maybe this really is a real thing. Why not? Let's get a third random party involved in this. And it, and it totally could have been. Who knows? Yeah, maybe that ended up on the cutting room floor. But yeah, so she spins her this line of like, all right, yeah, we had to fake our death because we're secretly working on this project and we like totally need that weird synthesizer thing. So if you could just hand that to us, that'd be awesome. And I know it sounds like he's being snarky here, but I promise you, everyone, that is about equal to the line that she gives this poor Monica. She's like, yeah, sorry, um, we had to keep it on the DL that we're still alive, and it has something to do with that weird device thingy. Could you get that for us? That'd be great. That'd be killer. And that's the point where I was like, oh, okay, good. All right, I'm not crazy. They're not going to try and throw an entire new story at me. And then, okay, so then she returns, proceeds yeah, so to she not... runs back into the room, grabs the key, and just, like, sprints out. It's like, right. I'm going to be with my mom again! She doesn't She doesn't bother telling anybody about this. They just kind of look yeah. at her and be like, hey, uh, you want to explain yourself? And she's just like, nope. <laughs> I'm going to Disney World or the Congo. Okay, so they, so obviously they lose. Um, the people in the front figure it out when all the troops that have been dying in Marseille decide to pull back, and they're like, oh, maybe we're winning. Oh, wait. Like I said, this is around when I was just like, okay, I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna keep watching this movie, but I'm not registering anything else. All right, I'll see if I can fill in any plot holes as best I can. Um, once they get to the device, they use it to communicate to Skeletor. So that he can come and join them, because yeah, I think reasons. he wants to like march down Main Street and like humiliate T Man or something. I guess. See, personally, if it were me, I would have just used it to go back home and then leave him there, so that he was kind of a non-issue. Well, clearly, you didn't go to villainy school. I guess. Because <clears throat> villainy one hundred and one is you go and you gloat. Yep. And gloat he did. He lost a few more hundred men in order to do it, but he got to do it, by golly gosh. Yeah, on his giant hover tank throne. Speaking of which, I really want one of those. Yeah, I wonder if I could buy one for me and my kids, ages five and up. I got the, like, he comes and he gloats and he's all like, I've got the keys and you suck and you got to be my slave, he man. Or, oh yeah, I poisoned Courtney Cox. Yeah, she had it coming. Yeah, and he, like, sets the key on fire and hands it back to He-Man. It's like, all right, you're my slave now. Come along. 
And he man's are like, God damn it, I'm his slave now. I guess I gotta come along. Right. And they go back to eternity, and everyone else is all like left on Earth with their burnt out key. Which and... I think honestly was another big mistake that he that he makes. Like, yes, he destroyed it, but he also left it with the person that invented it. Again, this is just classic villainy. Of you okay. have to give the good guy some sort of way to escape your easily escapable death trap. See, this is why I think if I'm ever an evil genius and I'm going to like try to blow the world up or something, I'm going to make it so that the bomb blows up on on the third second. <laughs> because you know that bomb that bomb is going to be diffused at the last second. So if you program it to explode when it gets to three instead of when it gets to zero, they're not going to get there in time. So yeah, he like poisons Courtney Cox, burns the key, and then pisses off. And everyone's like, oh, no, what do we do? Like, the key... Even though it was set on fire with magic, it still works. It just, I don't remember the song that I have to play in order to get back to eternity. And it's like, damn. Thankfully, Kevin Sanchez and his sweet synthesizer career is like, oh, I totally remember that song. Let me go grab my keyboard and I can play it for you. And, um, yeah, where are we called? Oh, Benjamin Cumberbatch. It's all like, you're a song maker? Oh, goody. And so he, like, Wires stuff up all uh, back to the future clock tower. And meanwhile, Captain Q-Ball is like, there's aliens in town, and let's get all the army together and go shoot the aliens who, like, fucked off an hour ago. Well, okay, so before we get to there, I just want to point out, and this just might be the inner musician in me. Uh The way he describes it, because by now we've gotten to the part to where he says, Oh, all of the universe's music, and this key basically just finds the chords that represent different locations in time and space. What are the odds? Just bear with me. What are the odds that the specific <laughs> coordinates that they're trying to get to happen to rest comfortably on a 64 note keyboard uh, <laughs> in a planet that is billions and billions of light years away good apparently because he just does a riff on his keyboard and it opens up the portal and they can go and save e-man it sure does but not but not before there's enough time for captain cuball to come in and i'm trying to remember specifically what happens i think it's like captain cuball brings out this army just so that when he finally finds somebody that might be involved he's like okay you guys wait here i'm gonna go check it out yeah he's gonna sneak up with them on them with his shotgun and because he raised the army to fight Skeletor's army, but Skeletor's army's already gone. So he just, like, finds a couple of kids playing keyboard in the park, and is like, all right, I'm going to go ruin their... Ah, oh, damn it, it's Kevin Sanchez again. Well, and here's the other thing. I don't know if you noticed this. He cocks his shotgun oh, yeah. a lot before he starts firing. So... Yeah, he's got no shells in that thing. <laughs> No, he's got shells. You see him flying out. But when it comes to that final fight scene, I'm surprised that he had any left because he clearly shouldn't. Well, I mean, it is a magic shotgun because in that final fight scene, he fires it about five times without ever cocking it. They, you know, they do the time warp again and send him back. Cut to just before this happens, we see um, basically the... It's the typical... I've won, watch me wield all this power, and now I have this weird suit, which, by the way, will be on sale after this movie is over. <laughs> you can pick it up at your local Walmart for nine ninety nine. And then we get into this really weird scene of Blade using a laser whip to whip He-Man. And here's... Yeah. And here's where it's kind of weird, because they don't they don't make mention of it, but I'm pretty sure this is what happens. They take He-Man's sword, which is sort of the source of his power, a la Thundercats. Uh-huh. And they stick it in this magic sword place next to the throne to harness the power. Yep. Which means that he should have lost his power and turned back into Adam. But he didn't turn back into Adam. He just kind of stayed He-Man and was very He-Manly. Yeah. Also, the sword seemed power something in, like, that weird iris over the throne room. Like, it wasn't just a holster for the sword. It was also, like, some sort of piece of technology that beeped and booped once there was a sword in it. Yeah. But, you know, we don't need to explain the actual important part of the story. I mean, we don't need to explain any of it, apparently. And then the time warp opens up, and we get to our awesome final fight scene. Yeah, because 
Skeletor goes gets all like a golden helmet, which is actually kind of nice for the actor because since they have so much like over his face, they do his um, practical effects makeup a little less, so he can actually move his mouth and emote a little bit. And so now he sh- and so now he shoots golden cosmic rays of deadly fire. Yeah, now he starts shooting lightning at people, making him even more emperor I'm trying to struggle to really remember how the fight scene goes down, but it was just, like, so generic. Yeah, I mean... I remember Captain Q-Ball shoots a bunch of people with a shotgun. Yeah, again, they're back in the same throne room they were in the beginning of the movie with one additional guy, Captain Q-Ball, in the fight. And they're fighting like the same. No, they're fighting like worse odds now because there's the same stormtroopers, but now Skeletor has his god powers. Yep. So but they win. Literally in the exact same position that they're like we have to run away from at the beginning of the movie. So they fight. Yeah, well, you um, saw where that got them. He Man pushes a statue next to some people, and then they die. Oh yeah. And he grabs his sword out of the beep boop machine next to the throne and he says the iconic line of I have the power oh my word I I almost could not handle like I had put up with with Dolph Lundgren's voice the whole time up to that point well he has like seven lines so it shouldn't have been that hard yeah it just mm. yeah they fight and then He-Man like breaks Skeletor's staff and that like cancels out his god powers from owning Castle Grayskull, I guess. And then, again, stealing more stuff from Star Wars, you know. So, now that his golden armor goes away, he's not in god mode anymore, and he's back in his, like, black robes and hood, He-Man throws him into an unnecessary, like, endless pit, which really is endless, because, like, there's a good three or four minutes of just Skeletor screaming as he's falling down this pit. It's, I mean, that classic, like, no, <gasps> no. I really hope one of these days we'll find, like, a movie that actually does justice to, like, the the bottomless pit having no bottom. So it's, like, going through the earth so that, like, you'll hear him go all the way through and, like, he'll spring back up a little. Like, he'll get all the way to the other end and then spring back up a little bit. So it'll be like, no, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> just because he keeps bobbing back and forth. <laughs> That's not how gravity works, but... <laughs> I can dream. <laughs> but yeah, so then, yay, they win. Soft fade out to the victory. Yeah, to a couple ending. of days later when the sorceress, like, cures Courtney Cox's poison and he hooks up Cap- she hooks up Captain Q-Ball with some random bitch and Q-Ball's all yeah, like, it- I'm staying here. They just gave me a woman. And a castle, apparently, because I said they gave me a castle. Oh, yeah, they give him a castle and a woman. And as far as I know, that's the only other person in Eternia. So, hot deal for him. That's, that's right. She was probably just like, oh, sweet, another person. Yeah, another living thing for me to interact with. Of course I'll sleep with him. Whatever <laughs> it takes. You literally are the only other person on this planet. Yep, so he decides to stay... Um, Benjamin Cumberbatch fixes the key so he can teleport them back. And this is the part where he reveals it's in time and anywhere in time and space. And I'm just like, yeah, he's like, are you sure you don't want to go back in time to like, he says some sort of historical event and I can't remember which one it is, but I remember it being like horrible. Like, I I hear the Holocaust is great this time of year. It's not this, but I'm just going to say it's this to sort of emphasize the point. Like, are you sure you wouldn't want to go back in time to, like, when Archbishop Franz Ferdinand was murdered? No. Wouldn't that be a hoot? He, like, says some sort of weird historical thing that, like, you really wouldn't want to go back and see. And she's like, no, just send me home. And then jump in the portal, like, oh, wait, my parents are still dead. I forgot to check the cemetery this morning. Uh, can we fix that? And, of course... He manages to do it at the last second because, as we've seen so far from every other time with this device, you can make last-second changes without large increments of time that would totally ruin your plans. I don't think so because he doesn't like she yells it out. Like she actually gets cut off of like, wait, can you send me back to? And then she like gets cut off by the portal, which makes me think that he just like 
either fucked it up and accidentally sent them back a couple of years in the past. Or that he was and knew about it and was really creepy because it's never explained in the story. Yeah, he was just like all up in her business. I was like, yeah, like, I know what you mean. Bro. But yeah, so it has the typical Hollywood happy ending. Her parents are still alive and she gets their plane tickets and runs away and says, haha, now you have to spend time with me. <laughs> but we're not going swimming. And I'm just going to go crying running into the streets in my nightie. Is that what that was? I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it's not a night. It's like a, um, it's a sleeping gown. Oh, okay. But it's weird and like... 80s. And no, it's like 40s. Oh. Like, oh dear. It's very old-fashioned and strange. But yeah, so she just goes running out in the street and like Kevin Sanchez is out in the street in his leather jacket still. Like he didn't get put into his pajamas for some reason. I was... Or maybe he Dude, sleeps in the leather jacket. I was going to say, you have to remember, he's a professional musician. That oh, yeah. uniform is grafted to his body. And so he just runs out there and it's like, don't let your parents get on that plane. And she's like, oh my god, you remember? She's like, oh yeah, we were there, remember? I'm holding this thing that you were holding before we flipped on the other side of the portal. Oh yeah. They give her a stone to remember Eternia by. And... It does glow. He ends up with it somehow. And when he holds it in his hand, there's an overlay of He-Man yelling, I have the power. Which I'm hoping, like, all this stone does is it's just like a little hologram of He-Man holding his sword and yelling, I have the power. <laughs> Which, by the way, that'll be on sale after the movie at your local Target yeah, for you can pick that up at local Walmart for nine ninety nine. <laughs> and then, mercifully, credits roll. Whew. Tell you what, that is quite a journey. It's quite a something. It's... I don't know what it is. Well, they want you to say it's a journey. I think that was something they said about journeys somewhere towards the end. Whatever. Yeah, they're... I don't even care. There was a long soliloquy about not saying goodbye or some shit. Yeah. So you may have noticed at some points in this, I was kind of making a stink about the director using the fantasy setting to realign their audience's moral compass. Uh-huh. I'm not done with that yet. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> well, I just wanted a nice podcast. You have to go ruin it with your political agenda. All right, what do you got for me? Well, okay, so part of what I was thinking, I was going to comment on the costuming in okay. the movie. So, clearly they're not afraid to show skin because that's what He-Man no. was doing the whole movie. And then there's the issue of Evil Lynn and Tila. Yeah, I mean, when we compare it to um, other movies of this sort of genre, like Hercules, they're wearing sort of, I mean, it's skin tight, but completely no. covering. No, not even. It's not even skin tight. Like, Tila's was was fairly... I mean, she had the spandex pants, but then she had, like, body armor over her chest. It wasn't even spandex pants. It was, like, 70s disco pants. Like, Lycra? Yeah, it was like she was wearing silver jazz pants or something. Like Something. But, I mean, it was form-fitting. I guess. Okay. And, Go and on so, with your point. Well, I guess, like, if you ever... If you ever see the cartoons, or just do an image search right now. Like, do Tila, Masters of the Universe. Okay, she appears to be wearing a cobra. Right, but there's... Why is she wearing a cobra? <laughs> this is... All right. Yeah, okay, so she's like wearing a cobra over her chest and a thong. Okay. Uh, this, this actually asks a lot more questions than... Oh my god, what rabbit hole have you sent me down, Drew? <laughs> well, suffi- what in the hell? Suffice it to say, they had a lot of potential options to go down the path that so many other of these action-y type movies, like Hercules, for example, went down. And they totally... and like, I don't want to say that they missed it. I think they intentionally decided not to do it. It's possible. I think it would be too much of a coincidence also seeing some of the other things that they put in the movie for that to be pure happenstance. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with you. There's definitely some choices with costuming. Also, note, what I've always heard about He-Man, this people sort of making fun of He-Man, is that there are a lot and a lot and a lot of like homosexual overtones. And I didn't get that from this movie. 
And I don't know if that was a conscientious choice of let's change some of this. Well, you know, that might explain why the only skin that is exposed is Dolph Lundgren's sexy, sexy gams and abs and pecs and muscle. I mean, yeah, that goes into it. And that all the main female characters are very plain Jane looking throughout the whole movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, um, when we first meet Courtney Cox, she's at the barbecue diner place, and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other waitresses there, and I honestly couldn't tell any of them apart. Yeah, they were very, very cookie cutter. So, what, what's your take on this movie overall? Um, I, I was really excited when I heard about this movie. I mean, it's got everything I want out of a bad movie to come out of the 80s. I mean, it's He-Man, which is supposed to be ridiculous. It's got Dolph Lundgren, who, you know, Ivan Drago, one of the best characters. Dolph Lundgren's done a lot of stellar, terrible work over his career. But ultimately, I was disappointed with it. Like I said at the beginning, Dolph's barely in this movie. Yeah. Um, they glazed over so much that I never knew what was going on. And, like, it was weird of, like, it, the writers seemed to be really excited about um, Act 2 of, all right, now we're on Earth, and He-Man and his crew are getting crazy antics. So we rushed through the introduction of what's going on. We rushed through everything to get to that point. And then once we're there and we built up the rising uh, action and got to the conflict, and then we needed to start resolving it, it felt like the writer's like, all right, I'm bored with the storyline now. Uh, they fight and then they win, I guess. Whatever. Move on. Like, it's really weird that they were excited for the middle of the movie. And we're like, they rushed to get there, and then once they got there, just petered out into just, I don't know what to do anymore. Yeah. And I can sort of see a lot of that in here, and I suspect, and this is kind of what might make it a little more off-putting for me, and I think just the production quality of this film only reinforces that, but I think very much a large part of this movie was influenced by it just being a flat-out cash grab. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, if you were to think back on it, what are the most expensive scenes going to be? The scenes in Eternia with all the fancy stage work, right? Mm-hmm. So, so where were those parts? They were at the beginning and the end. Those also happened to be the the most rushed scenes of the film. Yeah. So all that, so all that cheap film time that they had, that was all in the middle when they could just do, you know, B roll backdrop. Um, like a lot of the movie was very glitzy and glamoury, and it sort of it disappointed me because it made the parts that I normally look forward to being bad just seem disingenuous in a way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure if I went back and I really tried, I could find just as many plot holes in Hercules. Oh, absolutely. But there's so many other just terrible aspects of it. It's just such a perfect shit package in its own little flaming bow that... I can't help but just enjoy myself. And in this one, I could tell that there was a lot of spit and polish put into this. You know? Yeah. And I think it's interesting the effect that that spit and polish had on each of us individually because it irritated you and it made me just kind of tune it out. And so that when you pointed out these things that should have been obvious to me, I, like, I was like, how did I miss that? It's like, oh, because this was so like in my face that I just turned it out, I just focused elsewhere. I didn't even think about it. I just, like, it caused me to just shut down. Right. And I think overall, like, the end effect that it achieves is not that desired, this is, this is the, somebody's dream project that they, mm -hmm. that they saw through because they knew this was going to change the world. This was the, hey, we can make a lot of money, um, we'll have lots of, Glitz and glamour and explosions, and it'll be great. Um, you. Uh, what's your name? Don't care. Make a script. Do tomorrow. Go. <laughs> yeah. And so, I guess I... I don't know. I guess I can't be too hard on it. It had some It had some good bits, but... Yeah. I mean, there were, there were definitely parts that were amusing. There, there were parts I laughed at. But honestly, I have trouble remembering the movie. Not because it was unremarkable, but just because I got bombarded with a lot, but never got any of it explained. And 
And again, I think that had to do with the fact that this was a He-Man movie, right? This came out at, during close to the height of He-Man's popularity. This movie came out in 1986. Yeah. So, I I mean, obviously I wasn't around to... Or <laughs> if I even if I was around, I would not have been <laughs> able to comprehend the height of the popularity. I just kind of know it because I like weird, cheesy, obscure things. Um, but yeah, so I think the name... An understanding of the content in the movie would have been big enough of a draw for them to like look over those things. Mm-hmm. That now that we're looking back on it and we kind of want that background detail, we're not going to get it unless we watch the cartoon, right? And buy the fine products at Walmart <laughs> for nine ninety nine. I don't know how that business Seriously, model stays should... alive. Everything's nine ninety nine. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should ask Walmart when we call them for that uh, deal that we totally don't have with them yet since we've used their name how many times in this show? <laughs> uh, Bad Movie Book Club, not sponsored by Walmart. Yet? Yeah. We're working on it. Like, I'm a whore. Give me free shit. I'll plug your corporation. I don't care. Oh, I'd plug the crap out of Walmart if they gave us money to do this. <laughs> that changes the Walmart podcast we review Walmart movies for Walmart. That's right. Look at all those views we have. Don't you want to invest in us? <laughs> <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe if you want Walmart to, to sponsor us. Uh, I think it's safe to say we've officially run out of material for yeah. this show. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Um, no more. No more He-Man today. Nope. None at all. All right, so as always, guys, you know there's a way you can keep in contact with us. You can Feel free to leave a comment below now that we're on the YouTubes. I won't read it, but, you know, someone else can read it, maybe. I don't know, Drew, are you going to read comments? Um, who knows? Maybe. I'm feeling <laughs> sassy. Yeah, all right, so leave us a comment. Drew might read it. I definitely won't. <laughs> Also, feel free to send us an email. Watch bad movies at gmail.com. I'm not going to read uh, and, and as always, if you have Twitter, go fuck yourself. Yeah, go fuck you, Twitter. Bad Movie Book Club, definitely not sponsored by Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's not Walmart at all. Yeah. If I had to put things into a category of Twitter or Walmart, Twitter would definitely be not Walmart. Take that, Twitter. Yeah. Um, Got you again. And so one last announcement before we go. Uh... Liam, this was your this was your brainchild. Would you like to describe this to our lovelies? Yeah. So when we were originally coming up with what we wanted to do with this podcast, um, someone recommended, or it might have been Drew and I were talking about, of just let's see what we can do. Just looking into Nicolas Cage movies, and I was hesitant to want to watch Nicolas Cage movies, but March is coming up and. You know, it's almost March Madness. I was like, you know what we could do? We could do the March Madness Nicolas Cage cage match. We could watch 16 Nicolas Cage movies in one month and debate as to which one could be the most Nicolas Cage Nicolas Cage movie. Yes! I'm so excited for this. I'm going to lose my goddamn mind. Well, that was that was our whole worry going in, but I guess we're throwing caution to the wind on this one. Clearly, clearly, I don't respect my health, mental or otherwise, as much as I did when we started this, so whatever. And I only have to watch eight Nicolas Cage movies, you have to watch the other eight. Yep. Although as we get towards the end, we'll probably have to watch a couple other extras as well. I don't wanna. It's gonna hurt so good. So, you guys can look forward Uh not only to Liam and I debating these movies, but we also are going to have other guests, aka our friends on that we are going to try and pitch these movies to two movies will walk in per episode and only will one walk out alive and it will be the cagiest oh oh my god i just sometimes i look at the bracket that we've made should we make the bracket available so that people can start taking their bets now yes absolutely Um, make an office pool which cage movie do you think is the cagiest Yes, I will make sure I upload that to Facebook. I said it, so now I have to do it. And not Twitter. No, fuck Twitter. (laughs) Twitter's not Walmart. (laughs) 
You know what? I think we've just established the new Bad Movie Book Club tagline. Bad Movie Book Club. Twitter's not Walmart. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I have to put that on a t-shirt. Yeah, if if we ever make merch, that's definitely the first shirt that we have to make. <laughs> All right, good. I'm glad we've established this. Yeah, let's do more work for this. <laughs> And on that lovely note, I think we're going to call this a podcast. Oh, I get to go home now. <laughs> Back to my family. No, I'm sorry. You still have to spend two more weeks in the closet. Watching Nicolas Cage fucking movies. Don't worry, I'll slip him into you through the mail hatch. <laughs> so until March Madness, everybody, see you next time, and watch your own damn bad movies. Sort of a masterpiece. The head is one big pile of shit. Twitter's not Walmart.